Howdy doody buckaroonies and welcome back to another episode of Morning Coffee with Cameron. Today we're here to talk about a journey of the unexpected and in particular my unexpected love affair with this thing. The Polyend Tracker made by the criminally underrated Polyend who make not only some really cool devices but some very unique and inspiring devices for musicians and creators alike which is very refreshing to see in an industry that is all too often plagued by companies who seem to just rehash the same shit for 40 years and expect to indefinitely ride on their own coattails. This video really isn't meant to be a review of the Tracker. The Tracker has been out for a little while now and I don't think there's any point to me just reviewing the exact exact same things people have already talked about. So instead, I wanted to talk about my experience with the tracker and more importantly, the lessons I've learned along the way. Honestly, the tracker here is something I initially wrote off when I first heard about it as something that seemed a bit too niche and a bit too weird and maybe a bit too underpowered for what I would want to do with it. But I was very pleasantly surprised once again by my own ignorance and how much fun I've really had with this thing. Once I understood it, within just a couple of hours here, the tracker honestly had me questioning my entire approach to making music and writing songs. And I think there's really something to be said for this kind of astute minimalism and this approach to making music that taught me a lot. And it was stuff that not only helped me write music on the tracker, but a lot of lessons that I was able to then take into the DAW and into other projects and just, I think, make better tracks. One of the biggest things that kind of bugs me anymore is that I don't have a whole lot of time to make music. Between doing sound design work and content creation and making YouTube videos and everything else, it's just not something I have time for. I can't sit down and open up a DAW and sit there for hours and hours and hours making a track. And I know a lot of you have shared similar experiences, whether it's commitments with things like jobs or kids or family or whatever, there just often aren't enough hours in the day. Because of the tracker's inherent limitations, both as a tracker and as a hardware device, I find myself making a lot more music lately, which has just been awesome. And I think this is largely thanks to the fact that it removes so many of the questions and traditional pitfalls of working in a DAW. That isn't to say that the tracker here is without its frustrations and pain points, but in a way, perhaps that is the beauty of such a unique and quirky device. The tracker here is available now for the price of $649, and there is also the new 1.4 firmware update, which adds a lot of new features and functions to address some of the kind of issues and things the tracker couldn't do before, and really has pushed it into something that is a pretty formidable entry into the dawless world of stuff out there for producers to escape a traditional DAW approach and do something different or even use this as kind of a sequencer brain setup for your studio and your gear, which is pretty cool. At the risk of being somewhat redundant to existing tracker videos online, I think it's important to answer the big question, what the hell is a tracker? Judging by my YouTube analytics, maybe about half of you know what a tracker is, and I myself am just barely old enough to know what a tracker even is, and even then it's not something I've ever seriously used. Trackers came about in the late 80s and are, in a way, a precursor to the modern DAWs that we all know and love today. Although the workflow is almost entirely different, the core idea is more or less the same. We enter a sequence of stuff, and then we play it back. Now, where a tracker departs from a more traditional DAW is that it's entered in an almost spreadsheet-like interface and it works vertically rather than horizontally. But if you wanna change that, Polyen did actually add a new feature in the firmware update that allows you to play a pattern back horizontally if you feel so inclined to do that, and you can even change that on the fly as your pattern plays if for some reason you wanted to do that. Every track in a tracker performance can contain multiple instruments. Instead of one track being a bass, one being a kick, and so on, each step of a track in a tracker can contain an entirely different instrument and even have different effects applied on a per step basis. The only modern equivalent I can think of is maybe something like FL Studio, where a track can contain an audio event and then an automation clip and then a MIDI event and so on. The only real comparison is an actual software tracker with something like Renoise. That's where all these buttons here come in handy. In a tracker, we first enter a note, 
Then we define what instrument we want that note to play on. And then we have two effect slots that can contain any number of different effects with things like volume, panning, micro tuning, timing, the chance of a note occurring, the gate length, arpeggios, and all sorts of other interesting stuff that make making music on a tracker a pretty unique experience. It's not entirely unlike working in a DAW, but with the way most DAWs handle features like probability and rolls and other things, the tracker, in my opinion, seems to do them in just a bit of a faster and more intuitive way. All of this opens up a pretty granular approach to making music and really lets you dive into even the most minute of details to create an interesting performance out of what may be some relatively simple parts. There are some limits to this approach though. Tracks by nature are monophonic, so if we went to a new pattern and I wanted to create maybe a simple C minor triad, this is going to take up three different notes across three different tracks. I would have to enter C, and then I'd have to go over here and add a D sharp, and then add my G. So now this has eaten up three steps across three different tracks. This makes polyphony a bit of a challenge. When you consider that the tracker has only eight tracks, this type of real estate really comes at a premium, and the luxury of having everything being totally separate is typically non-existent in most tracker projects. To get around this though, Polyend added a very quick resampling feature that allows you to get some chords together for your performance and play them back as a sample. So we can select all of these notes and select a duration, maybe something like, I don't know, 16 steps. We can go into more, render the selection, and it's then going to resample this. So we'll render and load, wait for that to export. And now it has loaded that selection as an instrument and I can play that back. And we now have our C minor chord that we can play back. So in this project, for example, I've rendered out my chords first. And I can use that to write a polyphonic chord progression on a single track. All in all, trackers are a little bit weird, but Polyend, I think, have done a great job designing a fast and intuitive user experience that lets anyone lay down ideas quickly once you get the hang of it, even though it may be something that is entirely foreign. One thing I wanted to know about the Polyend tracker is how it might act as an entry into the world of dawless jamming and performance, which is something I've been very curious about and very much been wanting to try. The tracker is a standalone device and comes with a pretty sizable selection of samples and sounds to make music with it right out of the box. And everything you hear here is coming right from the tracker. If we go into the sample loader, there's a pretty sizable library of stuff right out of the box. Everything is stored on a micro SD card and the tracker comes with a micro SD to USB adapter so you can load up your own samples or wavetables onto the tracker or bring your projects or samples from the tracker into the DAW. So here I've loaded in a couple of my own sample packs and my own wavetables. Speaking of wavetables and samples, Polyend's tracker is actually a pretty formidable sound editing device and I was personally really curious to see how it might work as a portable sound design tool, either for when I'm out on the go or when I want to just change up my workflow a bit to make some new samples and loops for my day job of doing sound design stuff. If we go in here and load in a new sample, we can see that the tracker actually lets you playback samples in quite a few different ways if we go into the sample playback mode here. This ranges from traditional one-shot samples to things like looping. We have a forward, backward, and ping pong mode. We can even slice samples, so we can do the auto slice here. Let's just confirm that, and now we can play back different slices of this sample. This is great for doing things like drum breaks and whatnot. We can even turn samples into wavetables with different window lengths and stuff. So we could go here and... play through that loop as a wavetable, which is kind of cool. There's also a pretty rudimentary granular mode. This is pretty straightforward. It's just a single grain with some different window shapes and stuff. We can change the position. We can change the length. We can change the loop type. 
And I think you get the idea. The granular mode is a little bit underwhelming and there are some quirks with the samplers. I think one of the biggest things to me was that with the looping modes, if we do something like the uh, forward loop here, let's go to the loop start and loop end. If I play this back, there is no way to add a crossfade, which seems a bit weird. So I don't know why that happened, but you know, maybe that's something that they will address. Polyend regularly seems to update the tracker, and from what I've seen, do take note of the feedback they receive in their community forums and elsewhere online, so I really wouldn't be surprised if future updates address some of these kind of quirks and other issues. On the sampler front, the tracker has a few cool abilities that allow you to edit sounds on the go. First off, I think one of the more interesting ones is if we go into the sample recorder, we actually have a built-in radio, and we can go through and record different samples. I don't really know if there's a... Sure, here's a commercial. Tech picks up the pace and they give it off to Black Shear again this time. There we go. Now we've got a brand new sample. We could go in here and crop this down. We could, you know, do something like that maybe. We can zoom in and really dial things in. We can do a whole lot of stuff with this. And I think that's probably one of the coolest things about it. Another great feature that I want to point out really quickly is the auto naming functionality, which is often just hilarious. If I go into save this, we can auto name, and now we've got our new sample aftermath skin, of course, so definitely gonna save that. The tracker does also have an input here, so that's kind of cool and allows you to record stuff on the go if you had a non-powered microphone because the tracker can't supply phantom power, or if you had an aux cord and wanted to plug it in maybe to a turntable or something like that and record some samples on the go. If we hop over into the sample editor, there are quite a few features that we can use to edit our samples. We could maybe go in and normalize a sound. We could maybe do something like add a little bit of bit crushing and let's see what that sounds like. Maybe we'll drop the rate a little bit. Cool, and now we can apply that and we've now committed that into this. We've got tons of other things, chorus, flanger, EQs, compressors, a tool to smooth sounds out to act better as wavetables, some time stretching, as well as other basic functionalities like fading in and fading out. Overall, the tracker has quite a few useful features to edit sounds and take a rough raw recording to something that you can save and export for later. Each instrument on the tracker also features a pretty good set of parameter controls, so if we go in here to the instrument parameters, after this sample saves, we can do all the traditional stuff. Maybe we could go in and tune this down like an octave. Something like that. We could go in and add maybe a filter. We could go in and add some reverb and delay. We could go in here and maybe do something like adding an LFO to the filter cutoff and sync it up to our project and get kind of a cool steppy sample and holdy sort of thing. Maybe we'll change that to random. And now we've got a new instrument. If we wanted to maybe change this to something a bit more playable, we could change this to be a wavetable, find a good position. Maybe just something like that. And now we've got... A fully playable instrument from one of the included samples on the tracker. Considering all of the functions that the tracker packs in for editing sounds, as well as the super fast resampling feature, like let's say these were two different snare layers, I could just resample that into a new sample and then rinse and repeat that entire process, you get a pretty ridiculous amount of control over editing samples on this thing and then turning them into new samples to use in your projects or sell in sample packs or 
take them and put them into your DAW or something like that. With that said, one kind of big point of contention for me with the tracker is that the export options are limited to 441K at 16 bit. So it's really not the highest quality export and may not be acceptable to release as is for most commercial sample pack uses. And I hope to see PolyN change that in the future if the hardware is capable of exporting higher quality audio. Overall, the tracker is not exactly ideal as a portable sound design workstation, but it's definitely got a lot of features that make it more than capable of manipulating sounds and samples to create something new. One of my favorite things about the tracker is how easy it is to just pick up and make music with. It's also incredibly lightweight and portable, and it can even be powered by a standard phone battery bank. The tracker doesn't seem to require much power at all, and in my experience, it seems like it would last probably the better part of a full day with a decent battery. Jamming on the tracker as a portable device is actually a ton of fun, and I think this is largely due to the performance mode. This mode lets you play back different patterns and apply effects to individual tracks or groups of tracks like filters, the tracker's built-in delay and reverb, things like beat repeats, and other basic effects to make some pretty cool improvised performances out of your patterns. The performance mode also lets you mix and match patterns of different lengths, which can be very interesting for some aleatoric things or pseudo tape loop things or just general ambient style pieces. The tracker here also features MIDI in and out ports, so if working with these pads isn't your thing, or you're like me and you have gigantic gorilla hands, you can use an external controller to enter notes into the tracker. The MIDI output function, of course, allows you to use the tracker to either control plugins in your DAW or external hardware synths. To do that, you can just go into the instruments and scroll down, and you get access to MIDI channels 1 through 16 for all of your conventional MIDI stuff needs. With the MIDI out, you could also, of course, use the tracker as a MIDI controller for your DAW. So if you wanted to use the tracker and quantize all of these pads to a scale and use that to enter notes in your DAW, you can certainly do that. Otherwise, you could create a sequence on the tracker and send that into your DAW and use the tracker as the sequencer and the DAW as the instrument, more or less. Or you could enter a sequence here and send it out to your favorite hardware synths and split it up and do whatever you want with. The tracker can be a lot of fun to experiment with when it comes to MIDI devices because you can do things like change the MIDI channel on each individual step or even add probability as I have done here to each individual step and create some cool generative performances very, very quickly. What I've done here in this case is actually just go through and then select everything like this, went into the fill mode and filled each of these notes in with a random note from a certain scale and then went in and filled random notes with random probabilities that the tracker would choose and i did that across four different channels so now i've got four channels of midi stuff with randomly entered notes and random entered probabilities for each note and built a generative sequence in like five seconds. As a sequencer tool, the tracker is a pretty unique option to enter into the world of dawless jamming in your studio. Patterns on the tracker can go up to 128 steps and you can have up to 255 patterns in an individual project. Between this and things like the unique playback modes in the performance tab here, we could have a pattern playback randomly backwards or forwards and all the other stuff that the tracker can do, you can create some pretty impressive pieces by just throwing out some MIDI into whatever you want, whether that's your DAW or your favorite hardware synthesizers. To demonstrate that a little bit here, I've got a project with two different patterns in it, so I just generated some random stuff and added some probability by just filling in everything, and I've hooked this up into the handy dandy Waldorf Blofeld. This is running a multi, so it's a multi timbral patch. I've got tracks one, two, three, and four outputting MIDI channel one, two, three, and four respectively. Respectively, those go into individual layers of the multi in the blowfeld, and away we go with a generative sequence. If we flick into the perform tab here, we could start combining these different patterns. We could maybe even do something like grab a couple of these sequences and have them play back randomly. Unlock that one and maybe switch this one to play randomly. And 
and then maybe mute a couple and add a little bit of a breakdown. And bring it in. By combining that with a couple effects running in the DAW, you can see that this is a lot of fun to use with hardware or with plugins in the DAW. It's a super cool device and it makes doing interesting generative performances very, very easy. On the note of MIDI, one other thing to talk about is an effect here called MIDI chord. If we scroll all the way to the bottom, if we select that, we can then tap a pad to output a chord. This would be something like the original note, major, minor, sus2, sus4, and then a couple sevenths and ninths and other chords and stuff like that. But unfortunately, this feature is pretty crippled. While it does allow you to get a polyphonic step, which opens up some unique possibilities with the tracker when using external MIDI devices, whether that's software or hardware, you can't overwrite or change these chords, which is very, very unfortunate. In a future update, I would love it if Polyend were to offer some kind of chord editing tool for these chord pads, or even some kind of chord memory function allowing you to overwrite the existing chord options with your own chords by way of entering them on the pads or maybe using an external keyboard. With all that, let's talk pros and cons of the Polyend tracker. I've now brought in my plants and a candle as required by these types of videos. And also this candle is a plant. Once you burn through it, there's some seeds, you can water it and it goes from a candle into a plant. So take that all of you other synth tubers out there. So the pros of the Polyan Tracker, it is really, really well built. It feels nice and solid and has nice clacky keys, some really responsive pads and some good chonky metal components and overall just looks really damn sharp. The Tracker has a super unique workflow that makes you kind of rethink how you approach music. And I think that's pretty neat. There aren't many devices that really do something like that. Another cool thing is being able to import wavetables from things like Serum or whatever. That's just kind of a neat thing to be able to do on something like this. In fact, I actually imported all of the wavetables from Massive onto the tracker here. So if we go in there, I've got all of my wavetables from Massive and that's kind of cool. The tracker has a pretty solid learning curve and it's very intuitive for the most part. Although I did have to reference the manual pretty frequently at first, it's overall very well documented. And I think for such a unique device, it's not beyond the reach and scope of the average musician who has never used a tracker before. The tracker is also extremely portable and super fun to just pick up and play with. It's something I find myself coming back to frequently just to noodle tracks with and come up with ideas and then explore them later on. It's really fast to make music with, and I think it's a good choice if you just don't have a whole lot of time to make music with and you just want to lay down some ideas and then revisit them later on. Most of all, though, like I said, I think it removes all of that option paralysis that many of us may suffer with in the DAW because the tracker in the end is simply a device to make music on. Obviously the biggest thing is that the tracker is just not as fully featured as a DAW and it's not really a similar experience where I feel like I can make a finished piece of music on it a lot of the times. Trackers by their nature do have a lot of quirks and idiosyncrasies that certainly aren't for everyone, but once you learn to look past them, it is actually quite fun to use. I will say as well that I think many of the criticisms I found about the tracker online are just a case of people who didn't seem to manage their expectations or know what they were getting into. There are some things that do need fixing and changing, I think, but I'm pretty confident in saying that Polyend will make that happen. Another big thing I noticed in my time with the tracker is that in some cases I would get a lot of clicks and pops with certain things, and it seemed like maybe that's something to do with the note off message terminating a sound on a non-zero crossing, so sometimes I would really have to go in into the sample editor and like really dial something in to work, and that was kind of tedious, but maybe that's something that could be addressed in a future firmware update. I do really wish that the tracker had more tracks. I do find eight tracks pretty frustrating at times, but again, I feel like I'm able to make many ideas on this and then bring them into the DAW to finish them out. But if the tracker, say, had 16 tracks, I think I could legitimately make pretty finished pieces of music on this. And maybe though that's Due to personal taste, I, you know, do like to layer and add lots of little things in my tracks, but, you know, your mileage may vary. 
The tracker also has a distinctly digital sound, and sometimes that is to a fault. While in some cases this may be desirable for more of a kind of gritty and lo-fi approach, I think Ricky Tynes has done some really great jams on the tracker that show that kind of character, it does sometimes feel a bit sterile and needs some work in the DAW to bring a track back to life. Another big thing to me was that the filters in the tracker really do leave something to be desired. They're not really that interesting and they're a bit limited. I would love to see maybe a few additional modeled filter types and some control over things like the filter slope just to get a bit more mileage out of the filters and add a bit more character to sounds. Another big thing is that the LFOs are kind of limited. There are a couple shapes here, but there isn't like a sample and glide LFO, for example, which I think would be very useful to add some drift and movement to elements playing on the tracker to make things feel a bit more lively and organic. And the LFOs are also only bipolar, which can be kind of frustrating at times. I do wish there was a way to make LFOs unipolar, and that might make some of the LFO features a bit more useful in some cases. One final thing I will say is that at first the tracker was maybe a little bit crashy and buggy and not super stable, but with the release of the new 1.4 firmware, it seems significantly more stable. I've only had maybe one or two uh, freezes or crashes. I don't really know what I would call them. It's not that I lose the data, it's that it just gets stuck and I have to turn it off and turn it back on and then everything I had done was still there. So it's not necessarily a crash and it's not really the end of the world. It's just something that happens every once in a while, but it seems a lot more rare with this new update. So very good job, Polyend, on that. Polyend's tracker is a very unique and interesting entry into the world of dollless jam boxes and hardware sequencer type devices. I honestly can't think of any real competition to this outside of perhaps the upcoming NerdSeq portable from XOR Electronics. Outside of that, there's really only something like maybe the 1010 black box, which I do want to try, but is pretty much entirely different in its approach and applications, or maybe something like Electron's Digitact, but again, that's very much apples and oranges. With that, I would really like to commend Polyend for releasing something that I suppose amounts to be a bit of a risk. I don't really know how much demand there was in the market for a hardware tracker, but it is very interesting to see, and it's certainly not something I ever expected to see. And further to that, I would like to commend Polyend for taking something that is maybe somewhat exotic and making it very approachable for people even like me who have never touched or seriously used a tracker before. Although the tracker isn't quite as powerful as something like Renoise or other dedicated tracker software, it does pack in a whole lot of fun and a whole lot of features for the price point. And I think many of my sentiments with the Moto Cobalt 8 even carry over here in that due to its limitations and its quirks, it's one of those things I constantly find myself reaching for just due to how fun and fast it is to create something with, and I think that's pretty powerful. Of course, a very big thank you to Polyend as well as Voltage and Company for sending along the tracker for me to play around with and try out and of course share with all of you. With that, what do you think of the Polyend tracker? I think it's a pretty interesting and maybe a little bit of an exotic device out there and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, so let me know what you think down in the comments below. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you learned something, and as always, I hope this inspires you to get out there and make something awesome.